The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello. Welcome, everybody, or welcome back if you're a return visitor here to Coffee with Cleffy. And uh, hello to everybody. I see Clyde Thornton out there today, and my son Max is online. Hello. How everything is well out in the West. Um, topic today, heat migration and hydronic and plumbing systems. We're going to talk about how heat can move through a system even though you may not want it to or maybe it's not going where you do want it to. Uh, even without a pump running, we can have heat moving through pipes. So that's kind of what, where we're going with this both. And uh, Plumbing loosely took one of John's uh, quotes here about uh, what thermal migration is, a definition of it possibly, and that's basically uh, when you heat water, the density decreases, and it's going to try and rise above colder water. And I guess a good example of that would be uh, jumping a lake, jumping into an ocean or something like that, and you'll feel it would be warm at the top, and the deeper you dive down there, it's colder. Well, that's what's happening is that warmer heated water is rising up to the top, and the colder water is down at the bottom. So that can happen in uh, a hydronic system, in a closed-loop system also, and it's not always desirable. And so we're going to talk about uh, when that might be beneficial, when you don't want that different uh, components or different things you can do to eliminate that or um, uh, diagnose it and stuff like that. So basically, if there's a path, if there's a piping loop that provides a method for hot water to rise up and the colder water to sink down, you're going to get what's called thermal migration or sometimes it's called ghost flow is another word that you might see used to uh, describe that. Um, so I couldn't find anything really online that really said thermal migration, but I thought I'd just switch it around there and there's migration to thermal. I would expect the guy there in the, in the right-hand photo is experiencing some uh, thermal shock there and is probably going to be turning around and going the opposite direction quickly. So um, warm water rises. That's uh, the bottom line to this. Uh, as the density decreases and fluids are warmed, it's going to rise up just like warm air does. I mean, that's what makes a hot air balloon go up in the air. They put a big burner under that balloon and warm up the air and the, and the balloon rises. Now there was a time when uh, designers and installers um, understood that and before we had, uh, they were called booster pumps originally, circulator pumps, I mean that's how the heating systems would operate with just gravity flow where the hot water would rise up. They knew how to design those systems so they had um, you know, large diameter piping, they had pitch or slope into the piping so that warm water could rise up, the cooler water could come down, and that's what would move the heat throughout the building through the radiators typically is um, just the buoyancy, the gravity. Um, um, hydronic systems. Then, of course, around, I don't know the exact date on this. I read in the, some of the Bell and Gossip material about 1940s sometime is when booster circulators started coming out, and um, that would enhance the performance. They could do things they weren't able to do before, which was one of the big things for them was now they could put the boiler anywhere in the building because, uh, you know, with the circulator pumps, they could move the fluid uh, wherever they want to. They could zone it easier, and they could shut flows off and stuff like that. So, um, so that's the thing about hot water rising. It can cause thermal migration. It actually can cause some circulation to develop in your system. And um, again, it can be called gravity flow or ghost flow. Um, you might have that in the home where people say, you know, I've got my thermostat turned all the way down in my bedroom upstairs, and yet the heat keeps coming out over the course of a couple of days or weeks. You know, my, ther my temperature on my thermostat keeps going up. I've had the contractor over here. He assures me everything's working right. You know, the pumps are shutting off, zone valves are shut off, but I still have some heat coming out. Well, it's Mother Nature dislikes an imbalance. So if she sees a cold pocket of water and she's got a belly full of hot water down in the boiler, they're going to try and equalize out. And they're going to go through valves, they're going to go through fittings, they're going to do whatever they can to uh, equalize that uh, temperature difference. And what drives that is the temperature difference. So the greater the temperature difference, the wider the delta T, the more potential for that thermal migration. So for example, you've got a baseboard su circuit upstairs in your bedroom sitting there at ambient room temperature of maybe 70 degrees or something like that, and you've got a boiler downstairs that's firing for indirect heat or something possibly in the summer, it's sitting there at 180 degrees with a p proper or improper piping path, that hot water is going to try and migrate up to that baseboard, and you're going to have some... Uh, uh, some heat going somewhere when you don't want it. And uh, now there are times when that's desirable. There's uh, different applications that we want um, the hot water to rise. One example would be um, a stratification in a, in a domestic water uh, storage tank, for example. We want that hot water to rise up to the top. We've got our control thermostat near the bottom of the tank or the solar tank, shutting it off when it's maybe 140 down there. But we can stack a little bit more energy in that tank if we allow that tank to stratify that hot water to migrate up to the top. Um, another example, there were some uh, domestic water research systems that were piped and still piped. I know Dave Gates is a big fan of this, has it in his own house, where he's actually circulating the water through um, his domestic water loop with just thermal migration, where he's got the pipe sloped right, least amount of fitting, so that water can just move around there slowly without having to have a pump on it, where he's got 
um, hot water out to the spur of the fixtures by just piping that um, uh, properly so that you can get that flow through there. So if we don't want that, what do we do? So we're going to look at some products and some techniques that we can do to shut off that thermal migration if we think we've got flow going somewhere, heat going somewhere where we don't want it. So really what we need is some kind of means or mechanism to completely shut off a flow, 100% shut off. Um, over the years, different products have been used to try and do that. Swing checks are out there. That's probably the most common. In fact, as I did research on this, I went to a lot of uh, check valve manufacturers' websites to get information on the different types of check valves, why you choose one over the other, the pros and cons of different types of check valves. And it turns out that that's the number three most um, common valve in the world is a swing or a check valve of different types of check valves after uh, shut off valves like globe valves or gate valves for example the check valve is number three so you certainly see a lot of them in the industrial applications and the air you know uh, compressed air applications or petroleum industry so there's a lot of different types of checks out there but Typically in the hydronic industry, we're going to look at a couple of different types. It's going to be a weighted flow check where the weight of the, uh, the plug inside there is what closes off the flow when the pump stops. That's what shuts it off so you don't have that uh, thermal migration or ghost flow. They're going to be built with a certain weight of a plug in there, and that's what gives you that restriction to close that. Uh, spring checks are another way to do it. Those are really common now. You'll see a lot of the circulators. We'll show you some pictures. have spring checks now built right into the volute so you don't have to uh, pipe them separately. And then um, we tried thermal traps, and I tried thermal traps, I should say, and I didn't have very good luck with them. I'm sure it was a little bit of operator error on my point, on my part with that. But um, there is the potential to just pipe down a, a loop down to the bottom, down to the floor, something back up. And if you get enough of a thermal trap, you can stop some of that migration. I'll show you some pictures of that. And, but the main thing is going to be a check valve, but it's really critical that you select the right type and the right check valve for the application because you can create some uh, different problems if you misapply a valve. So I want to look at some of the different valves. Again, indications that you've got thermal migration or ghost flow in a heating system would be, you know, control thermostats turned off, but zones are still overheating. Boilers running in the middle of the summertime when there's no call for heat. That indicates uh, you've got some movement of heat going out somewhere that's calling that back on. I would say probably the, one of the things that you can notice if you drive through like New York City or any big city in the wintertime and you look around and you see somebody's got a coffee mug or something propped under their window with their window open because the heat just doesn't shut off or keeps going because the thermostatic valve isn't shutting off properly or they don't have control on it and their, their control thermostat's really their window instead of the, the valve or the control on the wall. And of course, that can present itself as uh, in your fuel bills. If you're getting high uh, gas bills in the summertime when you know you're not using much energy for um, uh, domestic water or anything else, it could be an indication you've got some flows going somewhere that you're not aware of. And, you know, if it was in a garage floor or something like that, you might not notice that. You might have some thermal migration, some heat going out to a radiant zone in your garage floor. Nobody's really paying attention to that. And um, yet your boiler is firing, you've got some gas bills and uh, some energy costs that you really don't need there. So the thing to do is avoid some of those piping uh, configurations that would induce that or would... Uh, um, enhance that is when you put this, um, the system together. Um, another thing, I've got sized circulators correctly, because sometimes what we interpret or what we think is a ghost flow might be that we've got a pump that's oversized and it's actually pushing through a zone valve or something like that. You've got a zone valve that can't shut off tightly against the delta P that maybe a high head pump at a circuit somewhere is pushing through. So you might think, well, I've got ghost flow, when in fact you've got a valve that isn't shutting off tightly against the, um, the delta P that the pump is putting into the system. Gravity gates is another word for it. That's a European term that I picked up. A lot of the solar components that will be shown, you have what they call gravity gates, and it's just another word for a check valve. But another thing is a hydraulic separator is another way to prevent this. If you've got a, a couple different piping circuits with two different size pumps, and you've got the pump pushing flow into your distribution side when you don't want a, um, um, hydraulic separator is another way to, to uh, isolate those two flows that could prevent flow going across into the distribution when you don't want it from the, the primary side piping or pumping. Uh, the appropriate zone valve, there are different types of zone valves out there that have different shutoff pressures and the reason for that is if you have a job where you've got a, a pump that develops a high delta P, you've got to select the right zone valve that it can shut off against that pressure. If you've got a commercial building that's got a pump that's developing, you know, 30, 40 uh, pounds delta P when it fires up and your zone valve's only got a 20 pound shut off, then you're going to have some bleed through through that. So um, you got to select the right valve for that. We do have some high shut off. We've got some zone valves that can shut off against 75 pounds pressure. So 
uh, make sure that you're applying the valve properly for the application. And probably the biggest and the newest thing that's hit the market now are these circulators that have the ability to change their output, change their um, pump head based on what's going on in the circuit. So um, that helps that issue a little bit too, that you're not over pumping circuits of zone valves or a circuit starts shutting off. Now the circulator's got some intelligence that it can ramp down and uh, change its output based on the, um, the hydraulics of the, the requirement of the system. So let's get into some drawings here. And so what I tried to put together here is a, a fairly typically uh, primary, secondary type of loop, because this is where you're probably going to see uh, thermal migration of ghost flows more than any type of piping configuration, because you've got some pathways here where flow can move around uh, even without pumps working. And that's really kind of how primary circuitry was intended to work, is you've got a loop. And in this loop here, I'm going to consider this where we've got, let me see my pointer here. I consider this boiler to be within the primary loop. So the, you know, we've got the flow coming out of the top of the boiler, going around here, and just coming right back to the boiler. Now, sometimes the boiler is removed from the primary loop if it's got a high pressure drop heat exchanger, for example, and it might be treated as a secondary. Then all we would do is reconnect this line right here, and now we've just got this big circle or rectangle here with a pump size just to move the flow around through that loop and then the boiler as the secondary would have its own flow. But let's use this as a simplified drawing of it. And then I've showed some takeoffs here, some secondary takeoffs to the primary loop. And the key there, of course, is the closely spaced T's. And the concept or the theory there is if you keep these T's uh, close together, there's very little. There can never be zero pressure drop between two T's, even with a close nipple putting them together. So you want to limit that pressure drop so that when this pump is running, it doesn't induce flow up through this circuit here. Well, that doesn't always happen. So what we've learned over the years is that we put these systems together. We said, well, you know, any time that you rise vertically off a horizontal line that has hot water, this room up here or this baseboard is cold, this is going to try and balance out that thermal equilibrium. This hot water is going to try and rise up and force this warm or cooler water back down the other side. So what we do then is we try and um, put some sort of device in there to, to uh, stop that 100%. So one way of doing it is put a check valve right here on the circulator, either at the discharge. A lot of the circulators now come with check valves um, either built in, in the box or in the box separately that you can insert into the discharge side of the, uh, the volute of the pump. So we did that. We went back and we said, yeah, that's probably the problem. Why well, we've had some issues. We put a check in there. We replaced the circulator with an integral check type. And uh, sometimes it fixed the problem. Sometimes it didn't. Because you can actually get a two-directional flow up one pipe here. So if you didn't have protection on this side here, the return side, you could actually have hot water going up the core of the pipe, the cold water coming down the side. And you can get what's called back-end flow sometimes, where you could actually get some thermal, some heat um, migrating up in this loop going up the return side. So then. We go back, we put a check valve or flow check or something on the return side also so that we've got 100% shut off on both sides of this. Now you could put a zone valve in there, but then, of course, you'd have to power that. Um, there's different types of check valves I'm going to show you that you could uh, use for that. There's swing checks, there's spring checks, there's soft seat checks. There's a lot of different check valves that um, are out there, and I'll show you what's uh, the best way we think to do that. Now, another way that we... Um, uh, tried to, to prevent that thermal migration on these loops up here is these thermal drops. Now I'm showing one on the supply and return because I, what I did in this picture here is I've taken the check valve out of the pump. So what's, uh, what we're trying to do here is if we have enough of a drop that we're, it's almost like a P-trap under a sink or something, we're going to trap the temperature down here so that hot water can push down through that trap and rise back up. Now. A couple jobs that I tried this on, I guess I didn't have enough drop. I had like maybe 18 or uh, two foot of drop here, and it wasn't sufficient to, to do that. Um, I'm thinking if you're going to try this, you might want to drop all the way down to the floor here. You might have you know five or six feet or eight feet of drop to be able to get enough um, you know resistance to keep that flow from going up there. To me, that starts to look kind of funky, where you've got these big loops going down to the floor and back up. You've got the piping and stuff like that. I, I think a more elegant solution is just find the right type of a check valve or a pump that offers that protection. This is one that can really bite you in the butt here, is when you've got an indirect tank. Um, because what can happen here, if you get this tank up to temperature, let's say you fired that thing up to 140 degrees, and this boiler shuts off, this pump is running for a call, you can actually take heat out of this um, indirect tank can try and migrate back into the primary loop, and then, of course, it can migrate up into these circuits if you don't have protection here. So it can go either direction. So you really want to have good protection, 100% shutoff protection on these indirect tanks when you take them off a primary loop like this. So um, I know some guys have gone back and put a zone valve in, and then when there's a call for heat, the call for heat on the indirect 
triggers his own valve, and then the end switch, of course, makes the relay, which turns on the pump. So that way you've got your pump and your zone valve as both your protection methods with the, um, the check valve and the pump and 100% shut off with the, um, with the zone valve on the other side. Now, not as critical if you have piping going down below the, um, the primary loop here because, again, it wants to rise up. It's the buoyancy that's driving that. So if you're going to take your takeoffs off the bottom here and go down, you're not going to experience that thermal migration. Now, another way of doing that is instead of going straight off the top of this, some guys will come off the side. I don't know if I can show that with the arrow this way and then go up so they don't have the straight path going up. And, of course, the straighter and the taller this is, the more it's going to um, enhance that thermal migration up there. So if that was a straight pipe up to the second floor like that, very little flow resistance in there with fittings or offsets or something, uh, that's really going to encourage that thermal migration. So that's really, in a nutshell, where you're going to see it. This is primary, secondary piping type of zone, uh, type of uh, piping where you don't have adequate protection on these, um, on these takeoffs here on the uh, closely spaced tees. So this is what we've got out there in the market right now. These are probably the most common um, devices that we use to stop flow or to pre pre prevent thermal migration. This first one here, uh, thanks to Bell and Gossip for the picture, is just a weighted plug in here. Now, there is a little bit more engineering than just a weighted plug. The shape of that plug is in there so it can vibrate and make noise. So it's the weight of the plug, the little uh, brass or uh, copper, or not copper, but iron plug that's in there that um, weights down here and shuts us off. This can be used as a straight through version or as an angle version. So you can plug off one of these ports and either go in and out or you can go straight through it. But it's really dependent on the weight of that plug in there. Um, so if you need a, a half pound lift on your, uh, your flow going through there, that's the weight of the plug in there. I think I've got the spec on what that weight is. Another way to do it is this is a check valve that's got a little bit of a spring in there that helps assist close that. I'm preferring this one of all the others, and I'll show you why here in a couple minutes. And this is probably the most common. You find this at any wholesaler in the U.S. is a swing check. Um, it's an inexpensive valve. It's a fairly simple valve inside. There's different types of valves. This happens to be a straight pattern. There are some Y patterns. But basically, there's just a little pin going through the side of that and then a little brass flapper. Some of them have a, um, a seal on it. might have an EPDM seal or something like that. Some of them are just a brass uh, gate that goes against the brass seal in there. But um, that's called a swing check. Pros and cons, the nice thing about um, these here, these are typically soft seated. They have a little um, a seat in there that when they close, you don't get a bang or a hammer to them. This type of valve here, the issue, and I think i got a cutaway coming. I can probably explain that better. These can cause water hammer in your systems if you have a swing check in there because the way they close and the, and the, the length of travel in that type of valve and the type of mechanism here. So let me see if we can get inside one of those and show you a little bit better here. But let me talk about the weighted uh, check valve type here. So basically this one here, you can see what the specs on this, it's got a tapered disc in there so it doesn't vibrate when the flow is going through it. This lever, by the way, is to manually open it. If you had maybe a pump failed or something like that and you wanted to get a little heat going through the system until you could get back and replace it, you can just turn this, I believe, counterclockwise, just like a nut and a bolt, and it would lift that plug off its seat in there. But it's really the flow that goes through there that's going to take about that much to lift it. Um, in a three-quarter size, that's what it takes to lift that check valve off its seat there and allow the flow to go through that. The caution on this, of course, with anything, be careful if you're putting a Teflon tape or pipe dope. If you get too much in there, a lot of solder flux, if you're going to solder to this, you can get that between that weighted plug and its seat, and then these things will leak through. It's not when, when we talk about check valves, I learned that there's a check valve that's called a tight seat and then a bubble tight seat. A bubble tight seat is where absolutely no flow, nothing can go through there, but there are check valves that are called a tight seat, which would be typically your brass to brass or metal to metal seat, where they do allow a little bit of flow going through there. They don't shut off tight like a, a kitchen faucet would, for example. You can have a little bit of flow in that type of check, and there's a reason for that. And, uh, in some industries, that's desirable with um, if they're pumping affluence or some dirty water or something through them. But um, let me talk a little bit now about swing checks. And this is a, an example of a swing check cutaway down here. And this is actually a pretty good one. Most of the uh, inexpensive ones don't have this little notch here where the gate can actually swing 100% out of the way. And so that's the difference typically between a wide pattern and a straight pattern um, swing check valve is how far this gate can swing open when it uh, when the flow comes through there. Now, a couple things with this type of valve is there's a CV number on this valve that's really critical to the application of this valve. And what you'll find with a swing check valve is it's going to have a really high CV, a real high flow rate number, because as you can see, when this gate swings completely out of the way, it's just a full port flow through there. In fact, this one's even got a little bit of a 
uh, a flow pattern that when that check swings up through this little arc here, you've got a straight through pattern. So that's desirable in some conditions, like if you're pumping uh, maybe sewage or you've got a sump pump that you might have some gravel or something going through. This type of valve has got a wide open passage that allows that to do that. And the other thing about this type of valve when it closes, it really depends a little bit on backflow to seat tightly, to seat properly, because the weight of the check isn't enough necessarily to close it tight. So it really wants the pump or whatever's flowing through here to shut off, and then it depends on a little bit of flow to shut that. But the main thing that um, I don't like about this type of valves on hydraulics is the, the distance that this thing has to move every time it shuts off, and that's what can induce water hammer in your system because this thing just gets momentum with the, when the flow stops, and it just slams against there, and you can get a little hammering. And the other thing that's important with this type of valve, if you don't size it properly and you don't have enough flow going through here, and you'll see, I think on my neck, oh no, I've got it right up there. For example, a one-inch swing check, and this is, comes right off one of the manufacturer's websites, and it's fairly typical from brand to brand, will have a 28 CV. That means in order for this gate to swing completely open and out of the flow pattern, out of the flow path, I should say, it needs 28 gallons a minute. Now, I know guys are putting a one-inch check of on a boiler that's got 8 or 10 gallon a minute flow because they said, well, I'm piping my boiler with one-inch pipe. It must need a one-inch swing check, and they put that in there, and two things are going to possibly happen. Is Number one, this valve is never going to open fully because it needs that full flow for this gate to swing up there completely. So valves, any valve, really, the CV of a valve is the number of the gallons a minute that flow through there with a pressure drop with the valve 100% open. So if this gate isn't going up and nestling up in its little um, open position here, you don't have that um, flow rate. Um, you've got a little restriction in there, so you're going to have some restriction. And you've also got the potential for this thing to be floating around in there. So let's say you put this valve on a, a pump that's moving eight gallons a minute, and this um, flapper might be sitting down in here. In fact, it might even bounce off against that closed position if there's not enough flow to hold it wide open. So for that reason, I don't think it's an ideal valve for a um, hydronic system because I think they get misapplied where people um, just select them by line size and don't pay attention to this number here. You'll see as we go, you'll see a swing check of that same pipe dimension is about a third the CV rate of that because a couple things, it's got more stuff in the way, so to speak, but also the, um, uh, the flow pattern through it, it doesn't allow that gate to swing right out of the way. So again, this valve is good for a sump pump, it's good for a sewage ejection pump. There's other applications where you'd use a check like that, but I'm not convinced that it's good for a hydronic system. So if you do have a system where every now and then you get a complaint where we get a little bang or a little hammer or something like that when a zone shuts off, when a pump shuts off, it could be that you've got a check valve in there that's, um, that's inducing that or causing that noise. So this is, I think, a better application uh, is to use a type, and this is a brand here, an Apollo brand, but they offer this actually this valve in two different configurations. And this is a spring, so this uses the spring tension to help close the thing here. I like the cone but just because of the flow pattern through this is a little bit better than a flat, flat disc, but this, both of these are silent. They call them silent closed because this goes against, there's actually a seal inside here, a little uh, EPDM or uh, some type of uh, O-ring in there that this seals against. So this is a bubble tight seal. So with this type of valve, you are going to get 100% shut off, and you are going to get a soft seat, and you are dependent on the spring to give you some of that close. You're not dependent on the change of flow direction or a little bit of backflow to seat it. And the other thing about this, it's a very short movement. So as soon as the pump shuts off, this valve is going to close almost instantly. In fact, if you've got this on a pump that's got maybe a variable speed function to it, as this, uh, the speed of the pump shuts down, the spring tension starts going away, and this valve is actually starting to close. So it's actually starting to close as the flow rate goes down. So it doesn't, like a swing check, have to go from this point all the way out to that point. So with that in mind, um, in fact, if you go to these websites or the manufacturers, they're going to say they recommend this for hydronic applications for the uh, the tightness of the seal as well as the, um, the spring assist to the closing on it. There actually are uh, gate valves, swing gate valves that have spring assist too that are used in industrial applications, but I've never seen that valve in the, uh, uh, on the shelf for hydronic application. So here's another example of a, a valve that's a trademark name to uh, Bell & Gossett called the Hydrotrol that was built specifically for hydronic applications. And it's got some really nice features. Number one, of course, it's all brass construction, so there's nothing here that can rust or um, uh, cause problems with uh, um, you know the water and getting flaking off the rusting uh, material in there. 
Again, this one can be used as a straight-through version or as an angle version. Uh, this is also nice in the fact that you can lock it open. So if you're flushing the system the first time, you want to make sure you've got all your dirt and debris, your copper shavings or whatever you might um, have in your system, you can lock it open to make sure you're not getting anything stuck between the seat and there. And it's got a real low, what they call a pop or crack. Sometimes that's the amount of pressure that it takes, one half PSI, for that valve to open there. And this is a cone seat like the one I just showed you in the previous slide. So that's a good um, a good device to use for stop and uh, uh, flow. And so we make a version of that at Cleffy. What we did is we take that uh, same type of um, check valve, that little neopearl actually, and uh, it, we use a cone pattern to it. And then, I don't know if you can see in the picture there, there is an O-ring seal that, that seals again. So you can see a real low uh, pop spring tension in here, about 0.29 PSI to pop that. So even if you've got a very small circulator, maybe a circulator on speed one of 1558 or whatever the smallest circulator you might need, still has the ability to pop this completely open. A uh, weighted check or a uh, um, the uh, swing check, you might not have enough pump power to even open that up if you've got that pump down at a low speed. In fact, we learned that lesson, and I don't know if some of you guys will remember this, when the Techmark controls first came out, we started doing variable speed on injection mixing and stuff. Originally, the way those things worked, they would start at a low speed and they would ramp up if you need more injection mixing. The pumps would start slow and ramp up. Well, what we were founding is on a low speed at 30% speed, they weren't popping the check valves or they were popping and closing, popping and closing. So. I think Techmar was one of the first to identify that problem. They said, well, we've got to start this pump at 100% speed first, make sure that we pop that open, and then ramp our speed down so we get these checks. Now, the manufacturers that are putting these in pumps um, have uh, um, changed the, the design of these a little bit. They've gotten much bigger. The original ones were kind of a small check, and they were having some flow restriction issues. So I've noticed now that they've hogged out the volutes, and they put a much bigger diameter uh, spring check like this in there so that they don't have the pressure drop going through it, and they've got the ability to pop that with a real low um, flow rate going through it. So basically what we did is we said, well, if we're going to do that, let's make it nice for the installer and give it to them in a union configuration. So now you can solder this into the system. Uh, solder it first and then put the check valve in it, please, so you don't melt it down. And then you've got the ability to open it up. So if something ever did get stuck in there and you had to service it, you've got the ability to split that open and service that or replace it. Um, you can see a real good flow rate going through that, a high CB, 12 and 17 in the two different pipe sizes, and um, all brass construction. So this is the type of valve I would encourage you to use um, is a, um, a soft-seated cone-shaped um, check valve with a spring assist to it. And so basically, I just again, here's a little shot of how that uh, curve of that type of check valve would work. You can see where it pops open. You can see the flow rate, very little restriction going through that. So a uh, high flow rate going through it, even with the, um, the small diameters here. So um, we do offer those. And that you'll see built into a lot of different devices. And there's a classic example of um, uh, one of the pumps that comes with the check valve built into it. You can remove those if there's an application where you don't need or want a check valve in there. You just I use it to take a needle nose or a channel locks and grab that there, and you can uh, pop that out of it. There was one thing that I learned with this type of thing is um, with this type of thing uh, being so close with this type of spring check close to the volute here is um, if you've got a pump that's piped in this configuration here off a primary loop, and you have a system that shuts off maybe in the summertime and there's a little bit of air that's gone through this primary loop because you've still got an indirect call or something calling downstream, some of that air can actually rise up into this pump and get trapped right here at the very uh, discharge of that pollute, and you can actually airlock or cavitate this pump when it goes to kick on the first time because with that check valve right tight against the uh, uh, the balloon the impeller there, that air bubble now is going to be trapped right in your impeller here. If you read all the information that you get from check valve manufacturers, they really prefer to see this check valve about five pipe diameters away from it. In fact, for a swing check, they recommend 10 pipe diameters away from it so it's not seeing turbulent flow. And also, in this case, it would allow a little bit of room for an air bubble to trap in there without uh, possibly locking or cavitating your pump. So uh, two things I think were a bit of a compromise. But at the end of the day, I think all the advantages and the pluses of having this check valve in there to prevent the ghost flow is probably offset by the the potential to have that happen. Now another thing you could do with this, I know a lot of the relay boxes out there now have uh, 
a pump exercisers on them where once a month they'll run this pump, so that might not be a bad idea to just make sure that anything that could get uh, trapped in here will pop that open and go through there. But uh, just be aware of that. If you go back in the heating system, you have a no heat call, it might be that you've got a, uh, a little air trapped in there. Most guys will just take a, a couple wrenches with them and just pop the bolts loose on their circulator flanges and burp that little bubble out and, and they'll take off. So be aware of that with that type of thing. So the selection process, of course, is the type of uh, fluid that you've got in the system, the temperature you're going to be operating at, the operating pressure of the system, the big one here being the CV rating of that valve. Make sure that the valve um, isn't oversized, that you don't have, a, you know, again, a 28 CV valve when you're only going to move eight gallons a minute through it, especially with the swing chip type of valve. And then you can order check valves with different pop pressures. Typically, the hydronic ones, every one that I looked at, has about that quarter PSI of pop pressure, which is... Um, low enough for even the smallest of the pumps to be able to open them up. So um, so here's a couple more examples of where you'll see um, check valves being used in applications in different products that we sell. Um, an important place to have them is on a solar thermal application because you've got the uh, solar collector up there, you've got a tank, and when this pump shuts off, you want to keep all that hot water that you just harvested in the tank down here. Um, in the tank and not going back up to the collector. So you actually need check protections on both sides of this so you don't get that reverse end flow. So inside here you'll see a couple uh, spring checks, uh, low pop pressure spring checks. These happen to be um, brass to brass seated checks in here. Um, so I have had a couple instances where they did leak through a little bit, but they are a spring check. Most of the time, uh, if you have a leaking check valve, it's an indication you've got something stuck in there. You might have to disassemble this right in here and uh, check and see again. Usually it's Teflon tape or something that was uh, that got in there from the installation of it. The other thing you can do on, um, on our solar pump stations, there's a check valve in there, and you can manually open that check valve. There's sometimes when... And, uh, I know in Europe when people go out of town in the summer for a month or something like that, they'll manually pop these check valves open so if their tank gets too hot during the day, it just thermal siphons that heat back through the collector at night. So it's kind of an overheat protection mechanism. And what they ask you to do is just put a little uh, open end or crescent wrench, you pull these gauges out, and you'll see this little flat uh, stem of the ball valve in there. And if you t turn that at a 45, what happens is the edge of the ball actually lifts open the check valve. So now the check valve is sort of taken out of the circuit. Now this system can actually... Uh, uh, you're actually ask, asking it to do some thermal migration to get, a, uh, get away from overheating your, uh, your tank and pop and relief valve and stuff like that. So it's a manual open position on that check valve. I don't think a lot of people realize that's built into that valve, the ability to open that up. So, And an indication of that is if you get down to more and you see that your collector temperature at 5 o'clock in the morning before the sun comes up as your collector temperature is warm, your temperature is leaving your tank and going back up to the collector and you gotta you got to identify what's caused that. you got a check valve leaking through somewhere. Oh, there it is, a cutaway of it. So that's what I did. I just put my bandsaw and cut away one of those uh, valves that's in the top of those uh, solar pump stations. You can see what happens right here is the edge of the ball, when it's turned at a 45 degree, is going to lift open this little uh, spring-loaded uh, brass-seated check in there. Other places you'll see it where it's important that we want to get some shutoff flow, you'll see in our radiator H valves, you'll see a little bit of a check valve built in there. Again, the same thing that when we're that uh, there's no call for heat now, we want to have a positive shutoff so that uh, that we built right into the um, the valve for you. Now we talked a little bit about the um, the potential to have thermal migration um, going over to an indirect tank that's piped piped off a primary loop. So I wanted to show you uh, another way of doing that that might help you. Uh, uh, prevent that. And I think it's actually a little cleaner way to pipe an indirect tank. If you're going to have a primary secondary loop, you can just pipe your indirect tank over here. Number one, you don't have to um, run the primary pump to get the heat to that. And this drawing right here, in order to, to charge this indirect tank, we're going to have to fire, obviously, the boiler, but we're going to have to fire this primary loop pump to get the heat energy going around and come back to it, and also the pump on the, uh, the indirect tank itself. So if you move that over and treated as a uh, parallel loop to the boiler. Now all you'd have to do is fire up this pump to get the heat through here, and now you don't have to heat up your entire primary loop and run that primary pump to get the heat over there. And then still you need the check protection here. I'd like to see either, you know, the spring check here or a zone valve, and then a check protected pump or, uh, again, another check valve put in, uh, in the piping downstream of the pump there. So then you're going to have 100% shut off. You've got a good bubble-free check on both sides for protection there. So. Uh, let's see what else do I have there. I think that's it on that one. 
Now there's other places that we put check valves and there's sometimes, like I say, that you want thermal migration. And one example of that is a, uh, this component that we make is our, um, as we call it, the 281 group. And this is really designed to be a uh, thermostatic uh, return protection valve and pump that we build. We typically build these for the wood boiler industry in Europe. We do offer them in the, in the market over here because there's more and more of these uh, biomass and wood fire boilers going in. And so what we did is we put a check valve in here, but what we make this um, check do is that if this pump goes out, we want to have some thermal migration because it's hard to shut a, a wood fire off instantly. It's not like a gas valve where you can just shut it off. So if the fire continues to burn and the power goes out for some reason that this pump isn't able to run, we're going to um, we're going to potentially boil in that boiler and pop the relief valve or turn the steam. So by putting a little weighted check in here, that check can open up and allow some thermal migration to go through there just from the, um, the buoyancy and the temperature difference in there. So there's an example where we can put a check in there that you can give it the ability to, uh, to open, or you can actually lock this check valve open. There's a little screw in there also that if you want to force it open, you can do that. So um, that's an example of a gravity gate where you do want it to open on its own. So in that case, you obviously wouldn't want a spring check valve that's going to shut tight every time that pumps off because we want to encourage that, um, that uh, flow going through that um, with a no pump running condition. Another place that uh, you can get their migration is hot water going out of your water heater up into your system and uh, causing the water heater to run occasionally because you're just losing that heat up to your pipe into the system. So there's different ways that we do that. A lot of the boiler, or boiler I'm sorry, water heater manufacturers are sending out these little um, stopper nipples that go on the top, and there's a couple different ways they do that. Some guys put a little ball in here, and the ball weight is what checks it down. So you'll have a, <coughs> excuse me, a red and a blue nipple, one's for the hot side, one's for the cold side and it's got a little check protection in there. Now, I've heard people say that these rubber types can cause some vibration at certain flow rates, and you'll hear a little noise in your system when somebody's running water. Um, if that's the case, maybe the ball type where they've got a weighted ball in here that, that can uh, offer the check protection would be another thing to do, and I think that's what I'm showing down in these pictures here is the, um, the other style with the, you can see right there with the ball in there that um, the intention there is that the water um, if something isn't flowing, these little uh, check valves just float down and up to shut it off. So obviously uh, down on the one side and up on the hot water side, and they give you check protection so you're not getting water out of there. I thought this was an elegant solution to that. This is a company over in Switzerland that makes solar tanks and uh, all sorts of tanks, really, for wood boilers and things. But what they do is they never bring a connection straight out of the top of the tank that can encourage thermal migration to go straight up. And so all their connections to the tank come in from the side, and not only do they come in from the side, but you can see they come in at an angle like that. So now it's kind of like a thermal trap. You're not going to get hot water coming out of this tank going down, down through that thing, and then going back up. So by going into the side of the tank and instead of the top of the tank, they've kind of built something like this in without having to put technology inside of it that could, um, you know, could fail or could cause uh, noise problems. So, I mean, that's something you could do yourself, too, if you have a side port on your tank. Maybe take your hot water of a, a side port instead. But... Um, uh, certainly a check valve or a, um, a zone valve could be put on top of a, a water heater if it's rated for um, domestic water use that could shut that off also if you've got um, something like that. And there are uh, trapper nipples that you can either build this in when you build um, a hot water tank that you're putting in the system, an indirect tank, solar tank, whatever it means. All you need is a little bit of a drop here. There are companies like Suchip actually makes this little thermal trap that you just put that right on top of the water heater and make your connection to the tank and out to your system here, and it, it gives you your uh, thermal stop through the, um, through the wind of the copper tube there. Okay, now the other thing that I talked about a little bit earlier, and uh, it, it, we're getting away a little bit from ghost flow here, but it's flow that's being introduced by a circulator because the valves can't shut off tightly. And um, what I'm showing here is that, you know, the pressure that the circulator develops is what these zone valves have to be able to shut off against. It's called the delta P or the, the pressure differential. So, again, if you had a gauge on the outlet side of your pump and you've got 10-pound static fill pressure in there, that pump fires up, you're going to see that gauge is going to go up. Depending on the size of the pump and the flow rate and stuff through the system, that pump's going to add some pressure. So you have to make sure, let's say you've got 12 pounds pressure in here, and this was a high-head pump that was going to add another you know, 15 pounds uh, delta P pressure to it, that zone valve needs to be able to close off against that pressure. And the other thing that can happen is when you have multiple zone valves in a system like this, and that's what I'm trying to show here with these operating curves changing, as the zone valves close, all the pump had, if this is a fixed speed circulator that was going through all four of these when they're all calling for they're all open, now it's going to one. If that one shuts off, it goes down to two. And when you're down to one zone valve open, all that flow from that pump is going to go through that one there. So um, 
you might want to pipe in a little bypass, a bypass pressure differential bypass, or use a, a circulator pump that will change its output based on the, uh, the, um, the zone valves opening and closing. So it's not really a ghost flow, but it is a, a thermal migration caused by a leakage through a zone valve that can't shut off against the pump. Uh, and you can certainly uh, uh, diagram that. You can identify that, and you can plot that on a pump curve. So if you take the pump curve or the pump that you have in there, and you can see it really gets pronounced with a steep uh, pump curve here. And then you can plot what the operating curve is. And where that crosses the pump curve, that's the operating point of the system. And you can see how that changes with a, a low head, a flat curve pump here um, as uh, compared to a high head pump. And this is exactly what, I don't want to go into this too much, because this is what we're going to go over in December and January with John Siegenthaler. He's going to show how to develop these curves, these operating, where you get the system curve crosses the uh, pump curve and developing these operating points and how that works with different types of pumps and how the delta P pump tries to just keep that at a straight line as possible. So that's a solution for a job. If you think you've got zone valves leaking through, possibly um, a different pump selection would uh, prevent that as opposed to trying to change the um, the piping in the system. And here's a valve that we still offer from Calepi. This is called a um, pressure activated bypass. And again, it's just like slipping the clutch on your truck when you're on a steep hill. That's what we're doing here. As zone valves close, we're just allowing some of that fluid uh, flow to slip by here. So it's a super simple valve. It's just got a spring that you load the tension on based on what your pump output is. And then as zone valves start shutting off, instead of all the flow going to the valves that are still open, we just shut it past this little um, seat in here with a spring uh, allows this diaphragm to push up, and then we shed some of that pump head right back to the return side of the boiler. It is a parasitic device. It is just kind of throttling away energy when there's a better way of doing it is not use the energy to begin with and just limit the amount that the pump's putting into it by varying the speed of the pump. But this is a good way to solve a problem with uh, flow going through zone valves where you don't uh, uh, need or want it. It's a pretty uh, inexpensive and simple thing to add into a system when you have uh, that problem. I'm of the opinion anytime you have more than four zone valves on a system and this is a fixed speed circulator, it's time to consider having a pressure bypass valve in there because there is the potential for these valves to not only not be able to shut off if you've got a high flow or high pressure condition, but also they can make noise. If you've got this thing set up where you've got eight gallons a minute going through um, four zones and then you start shutting that down and we've got one zone open, this pump can't change its speed. Now you've got some pretty high uh, velocity potential here, and you can get some noise, some hissing, or some wear in that uh, valve if you've got excessive uh, flow velocities going through it. So that's basically what we're trying to do with the, um, uh, the pressure-activated bypass, sometimes called a PAB, pressure-activated bypass, or PAV, sometimes V as in Victor, for a pressure-activated valve. And there's really the most elegant solution that we've got available to us uh, right now for a couple reasons. Number one, it's going to use less energy if you use these ECM delta uh, circulators, and also it's going to just nail. You can see what we've done here. Look what we've done to our operating uh, points here by using the delta P pump. Is there almost a straight line there? So we're always matching the output. Um, the, boy, the pump is always matching the output to requirement of the system by being able to um, uh, change its uh, speed, its output. Uh, based on the hydraulic conditions. So, um, yeah, that's just more of that. We talk about that in uh, issue number 15. We do show all these different drawings come out of there about delta P pumps. I'm kind of getting off the thermal migration a little bit here, but I just wanted to make you aware that it's not always a, a flow through a check valve or something like that. It could be a pump to cause on that. All right, I think I actually, for the first time ever, left some time for questions. So. Um, a couple other things, just some housekeeping things here. Of course, follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we are working on, see if i got a slide in here, we are working on the uh, Cleffy Excellence Program for the next year. You know, that kind of wrapped up here in June. We've run that for a year now, but we're going to make some tweaks to that and reintroduce it. So keep an eye out for that if you've got some jobs that you want to uh, that you want to show the world or that you're proud of. Certainly, we'd love to see those and get some pictures and uh, give the potential to get some uh, some gifts or some prizes from Cleffy. Um, the Coffee with Coffees, of course, are archived. I talked about that. Um, hit me with some questions, Mark, if you've got something. Yeah, well, thanks, Bob. I think we have at least three questions. Uh, first one, we have two in regard to the swing check. If you were to use a swing check valve in a hydronic system and you wanted to minimize the chance of water hammering to occur, What's your opinion on drilling a small hole in the gate to, um, to lessen that water hammering effect? 
yeah, you know, I've heard of that. I've never personally tried that. I don't know that it's a preferred way to do it. I don't think the manufacturer, but I know sometimes in uh, some pumps or sewage ejector pumps, I've heard of guys doing that to bleed some pressure back down. But, you know, you're kind of uh, changing the, what that valve was really intended to do. I'll tell you the best thing if you are going to use a swing check valve is just look at the spec sheet on it and pick the right size. And what you're going to find if you go to the manufacturer's site and you look at a swing check, if you want a check valve that's going to um, have a CV of like a 6, for example, you're down to sometimes a half-inch check valve to be able to do that. And that starts to look kind of funky if you're piping your boiler with one-inch pipe and you're going down through a half-inch check valve and back up. So it really has to do with the, uh, you know, the manufacturer's spec on that valve with a swing check. They're really not intended to be pipe-sized. They're intended to be sized by the flow rate that you intend to move through them. So that's that's what I've learned is the key to a swing check valve is um, is pay attention to the flow rate or you might not get a valve that either opens completely or it's just going to be floating kind of in limbo in there and just banging open and close because it doesn't have enough flow. And that's particularly important if you are going to start switching over variable speed pumps like it showed you in those last drawings there that the pump speed is changing. Maybe at 100% pump speed it's got enough flow to hold that swing check valve open, but now if that's going to be a delta P pump or something that's got the potential to ramp down or something, um, that check valve is just going to be floating all over the place in there. So, uh, you know, again, the bottom line, I guess, just consider a, you know, a, a spring check valve or a weighted check valve. For the, they're built specifically for that application. Where I just kind of feel that a swing check is really intended to be used on uh, sump pumps or uh, ejector pumps or well pumps or you know there are other applications in the air compressors. You know, you can use a swing check on an air compressor. But anyways, another question on swing checks. You made mention to when you put a swing check above a circulator in a vertical pipe um, installation to go five or six, I guess, um, pump diameters or whatever it was. Uh, pipe diameters or what, yeah. To, to avoid turbulence. Now, was that, uh, the question is, is that to um, eliminate any noise that that swing check could cause from turbulence? Well, both. I mean, if, especially if the, if, the, if the gate isn't swinging all the way open, you're going to have that uh, restriction in there, and you could have some noise as the flow goes through there. But also, again, it could start banging. The other thing I, I forgot to say, and I'm glad you brought that question up, is there are some check valve manufacturers. I always thought that the swing check always had to be out of horizontal piping. There are some manufacturers that say sometimes it can be used in a vertical application as long as the flow is going the right way. You don't want flow going down through a swing check valve because obviously the, the weight of the check can't swing it. But you can, some of the manufacturers, factors say that it's okay to use their swing checks on a vertical line as long as the flow direction is going up through it so that the weight of that gate is always, you know, um, gravity is pulling it down instead of trying to check the other way. And then there's some that say absolutely not, only horizontal application only. So as I researched this, I went to half a dozen different manufacturer sites and, uh, and it wasn't real clear to me is what the... Um, the conditions are when you wouldn't use a check valve on a, a vertical line or when you could. But, I would, again, I would just con, consult with the manufacturer and see what they say. I think some of them had to do with the uh, soft seat uh, facing on the swing checks, too, that they said, well, it's more for the banging. But uh, what it causes water hammer, I, I'll get off the top here a little bit, but water hammer is kind of an interesting, because as I started reading up on check valves, this water hammer kept coming up, so I started Googling water hammer. I found a bunch of great YouTube videos, by the way, on water hammer, and some of them were clear uh, plastic piping uh, um, schematics that people put together that would actually show you what happens with water hammer. And it's really a hydraulic shock, and sometimes they call it elastic shock. And it's one of the issues that comes up with backflow preventers. And if you want to experience uh, a water hammer is just put your finger over your pulse. That's what's going on there as your heart uh, stops and starts. That's what you're feeling is a uh, water hammer there. Now our veins are elastic enough. They can take that up without causing a problem, but the copper pipe obviously can't do that. But it actually is a shock wave that's created, and of course, depending on the flow rate and the pressure that you're shutting off against, the size of the piping, there's a lot of things that come to it. There was actually one engineering site that I found in there that had a, a solar, or not a solar, but a simulation program that would show hydraulic uh, water hammer hydraulic shock, and you could change all the different variables in there, the size of the pipe, the flow rate, how quickly the valve shut off and stuff like that. And it showed gauges on there, and the pressure actually can spike up in, in like a water a fire hydrant if somebody shuts off a four-inch flow quickly like that. I mean, you can hammer that whole system throughout the city, but the gauges actually jump up real high, and then they actually go low, and that's when the backflow preventers will jump off their seat and spit a little bit is when that arc comes down below the pressure that was into it, the static pressure, is when you can actually get a low-pressure condition as well as a high pressure from water hammer, hydraulic shock, or elastic shock, or all names for that. So thanks for jogging my memory on that. Another question. 
related to uh, backflow preventers was uh, are spring checks the devices used in backflow preventers? Is that what prevents backflow? Yeah, exactly. Well, in ours, uh, that's what we have in there. Is they're just the same little check valves that I showed you in those pictures. It's pretty much the same. Uh, there's different spring tensions on the two different check valves because you got the check on the boiler side, the check on the incoming side. Uh, I think we talk about that a little bit in our YouTube video, but maybe we need to revisit that. Uh, you know what we're going to do when we get our live demo wall going? We're going to show you a little bit about backflow preventers and what makes them spit in that, and we'll take one apart again and, and talk about that some more because I know we still get questions on that. But yeah, that's what's in there is a couple little cone shaped. Uh, spring uh, checks inside the uh, backflow preventers, and then of course the center uh, vented port where the fluid's going to leak out if one or both of those checks fail. Another question that came in was understanding that in a single pipe you can get um, thermal migration with the center of the pipe carrying water, hot water up, and the outside of the pump cool water down. Yeah, and I thought I had a great look of that. Yeah, understanding that, do you think it's a good rule of, of practice to make sure you put check valves on both the supply side of your circuit as well as the return side? Uh, definitely on a primary secondary, you you have to have check protection on, or a check in a thermal drop. You've got to have it on both sides. Don't you? I mean, not every system behaves the same way. I mean, there's different conditions that cause it. Again, it's the the delta t, uh, t, the temperature difference. You know how much piping you got, the size of the piping, the vertical rise, but why not? I mean, why even risk that for the cost of a check valve? You know, just do it. Um, you know, put them in when they're when you install it. So I would say all primary, secondary piping, uh, install a uh, check protection on both sides, the supply and return side, or you know whatever version of it, either the pump with the check valve and then a second check valve on the return side. So um, yeah, that's my suggestion, and I'm sticking to it. Um, another good, very good question uh, concerning. Um, thermal migration when you have a radiator. So in selecting a check valve or choosing a check valve when your circuit includes variable flow, such as when you have a thermostatic radiator valve put onto a radiator, um, does the fact that you have variable flow um, alter your criteria for selecting the appropriate check valve? Yes, and that's a good question, and that's why I like the cone shape. It's like when you do a balancing valve. You know, there's good, better, best type of balancing valves, and the best balancing valve is always going to have one that has valve authority. And by that, when they make the the shutoff mechanism or the adjusting mechanism there, they make it with a taper or cone shape, or sometimes if it's a real fine one, it could be a needle valve. And it's the shape or the face of that check valve and the way it lifts off of that seat that allows it to work at different flow conditions. And I think that's the whole reason that the pump manufacturers with, went with those neoperl type of check valves with that cone shape instead of a flat shape because the way the water flows through that and that it can lift and it can open sort of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, proportionally. So instead of like a swing check where it's fully open when the flow is on or fully closed, by using that shape on that cone shape on the end of that check valve, you get not only the ability to soft seat and have that bubble free check, but you get that ability for that thing to lift open. The way a spring check works is that valve, if you vary the speed, that valve is going to be open in proportion until the second that pump shuts off, and at that point in time is when that spring just seats it to the end. So it's not dependent on backflow like a swing check valve is, it's really the assist of the spring that closes it, but the second that pump shuts off, you've got that shut off, but it's really the shape of that cone uh, that allows, you know, very little pressure drop, number one, when it is open, because it is in the middle of the flow pattern, which is unlike a, a swing check. It swings completely out of the way, which is why you get this high CV. But with a cone check or this type of check, it's still in the flow pattern. So by making that cone shape, you get um, a good water flow going across it, as well as the ability for it to close uh, sort of proportionally as it does start um, closing off or if the flow rate of the pump changes. Okay. Here's another question. I'm not quite sure I know 100% what the question is, but I'll read it to you. It's in regards to wanting to offer a lead. This is plumbing application, by the way. Uh, okay. Offering a lead lag on storage type water heaters. The question is, uh, is there a valve that offers a change by control for pop? Hmm. I guess I'm not clear on what that. Did you understand the question? Valve that changes by. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what he's asking. There, are you, Mark? No, I, I I didn't understand it. So maybe if um, whoever wrote that might want to resubmit that. Yeah. Time to get that I know person. it's hard to type. 
Yeah, it's hard to type all that into that little box at the end and make it a clear question sometimes. But yeah, either call us or, or we'll we'll get a hold of you offline and see if we can clear that up and see what what you're trying to um, right. trying to right. ask us there. Uh, one thing I do while well, I got the slide up, I forgot to say this one. You know, if you want the certificate, there is a survey that should pop up at the end of the webinar. I mean, we'll get them to you regardless. But this makes it easy for Mary if you do the um, survey, then we know that you want it. We we'll get it out to you immediately. But uh, sometimes people say, hey, I didn't get my um, my certificate, and they didn't see the survey that pops up at the end. But uh, sorry to interrupt you there, but just want to make sure I got that. Um, anything else? What time are we looking at here? I mean, I'm borrowing somebody's office here. I'm at one of our reps in in Michigan, so I'm kind of uh, disheveled here a little bit with my technology, borrowing some equipment. But um, if you got well, one at, or two, we'd go. Um, we're at the top of the hour, and um, I, I think um, anyone else that has questions. Uh, Feel free to send them in to us. We'll get back with you one-on-one. -on -one. And yep. with that, thanks, Bob. I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for attending. And uh, again, give us feedback. Um, we'd like to hear everything from everybody. And um, hopefully tune in for the next ones. Give us some more topic ideas. We want to keep these going. We want to make them uh, informative and also something that's on your mind. Or if you are if you want to raise your hand and volunteer to help us with one, we'd love to hear from you. So um, thanks, everybody.